yeah, thank you, Andrea, for inviting me to today's uh, meetup. Um, I've been trying to attend these meetups for, <laughs> for a long time now, so it's given me a great excuse to be part of uh, the conversations. Um, and um, if anyone didn't see, um, I did also do a, a kind of presentation on participant-led engagement with immersive environments at the conference a few weeks ago. Um, feels like a long time ago now, but it was. It, um, it, um, if you are interested and didn't see that, then you can see that um, recording, I believe, on the ACMC um, YouTube channel. Um, so today I'm going to kind of touch on points of what I kind of uh, highlighted in that talk, but I want to kind of focus on curating. And although um, I am a digital participation curator, um, I don't necessarily deal with um, exhibition curating, uh, curation, um, but I will kind of talk about that um, in this presentation today. I'm going to kind of try and keep it down to about 20 minutes, um, but feel free to ask questions throughout. If you do have questions, you don't worry about interrupting me, um, or if you just want to put it in chat and we'll talk, we'll talk afterwards, that's also fine. Um, so as I said, I'm a digital participation curator at Quad in Derby. I'm also a freelance creative digital producer and consultant, and I primarily work with the participants participatory arts uh, sector. Um, I do quite a bit of work with socially engaged practice as well. Um, and this is where I work in Derby. This is Quad. Um, I like to include that because sometimes it's nice to see uh, the, loca the locations of where people are, are talking from. Um, so um, I developed Quads participatory and creative wellbeing programs, um, and that involves engaging participants in arts and culture through digital media. We are a centre for um, digital media, film and visual art, um, and we also house the International for Photography Festival format, which launches in a couple of weeks, two weeks in fact, um, and we're completely online this year, um, and I'll talk about that more um, in a moment, um, but it's an online photography festival with completely immersive spaces, which is quite exciting. Um, I lead the Digital Participatory Expedition with the East Midlands Participatory Arts Forum, which uh, is where we explore what we mean by digital participation in arts and culture, and that expands into work with Artworks Alliance, which I'm also a digital champion for. Um, I'm also alumni to the Extend Leadership Programme, um, which is run by Engage, a UK organisation, um, and I joined the Engage Council in 2019. Um, and I'm passionate about leading authentic participation, which enables a participant first approach to working with and within the medium of digital. And authentic is kind of something that is debatable within that. Um, so Today I'm going to talk about curating immersive environments and the kind of areas I'm going to look at are, I'm going to give you some examples of different immersive spaces to consider. Because when it comes to creating immersive environments, especially around VR, um, there are some hugely costly methods. Um, but there are some other things to consider within that. Um, I will touch upon participation and audience engagement. Um, uh, I'm going to kind of introduce you to some of the tools and software um, and I'm kind of going to touch upon current and future skills as well because I think um, there's some things that I can see there's some notifications for chat popping up but I can't actually see the chat so if there no, are any don't worry about it it's been me posting links to what you've mentioned okay. and stuff like that <laughs> so okay, I'm trying to, to keep uh, people on the loop on what you're saying and trying to give them a bit more information but uh yeah sorry about that <laughs> no that's fine um just if there were questions just shout shout out and I'll, I'll be able to answer them if I can um so what is an immersive environment um so this is a great kind of description that immersive environments are digitally mediated learning environments designed to engage users in an artificially created make-believe world. Um, immersive environments may take on board uh, a broad range of forms with affordances of varying degrees of sensory immersion, awareness uh, of the user's physical self or uh, the presence of others. So uh, if anyone's familiar with phenomenology, uh, that's a kind of um, something that really kind of ties into that. Um, the one thing I'm kind of highlighting with this, um, this description is around the kind of types of immersive environments that are things like MMOs, massive multiplayer online role playing games, uh, multi user online virtual worlds, um, surround sound screen projection like cave environments, if you're familiar with those with exhibition spaces, um, they are immersive environments, we 
we sometimes need to detach the kind of thinking away from VR headsets because immersive environments exist without them. Um, but some examples of kind of different um, immersive um, environments or accessing immersive environments. So you have virtual reality, so fully artificial environment, fully full immersion to AR, uh, augmented reality, which is about objects overlaid in the real world and, and uh, enhanced, um, as well as mixed reality where kind of one uh, affects the other. Um, and this is a really interesting example. Um, I did, uh, I did. Uh, if anyone knows it, the No Center for Curatorial Studies, I did a program uh, there a couple of years ago on exhibition design. And as part of the, um, the tasks, we were meant to kind of create a fictional exhibition. Um, and I kind of looking at what was interesting at the time, which is around VR, um, I wanted to make something that was tangible and physical um, and I came across the sword of Damocles and realized that it was at the time of writing, uh, it was 50 years from the creation of the first VR headset. So, you know, our, our kind of um, interest in immersiveness and immersive spaces kind of began in MIT now over 50 years ago. So, um, so I'm just going to shut this door. Um, so to think that VR and immersive technologies is something new, it's not, it's been going for quite a long time. Um, so some examples of virtual exhibitions. <clears throat> this um, is an exhibition by, I think it's Davy Jose, I think is the pronunciation, but he's an artist that lives with spinal cord injury um, uh, from a very young age. Um, and he created this virtual exhibition this is using VR headset, this is using controls, you can see the Vive controls there, um, that um, kind of is an exhibition of his work. Um, and the fantastic thing about it is that he is able to explore this work as uh, others would. So access um, and providing access, immersive spaces really, and immersive technologies especially, really has uh, a big role to play in that. Um, there's someone in the waiting room, I'm just going to let them in. Um, so there, there's a really fantastic exhibition and you can see this, after, if I have the links, I will share them. Um, you can um, see this online, a recording of it though, not um, the actual thing. Um, then I thought this was really fun. This was last year. There's been a lot of responses to lockdown um, and the pandemic and sharing work online, which has been a fantastic tool for hosting immersive spaces. Um, this is an, ex uh, an exhibition by an Australian photographer, Jason De Freitas. I may pronounce that wrong. Um, he created an entire exhibition in Minecraft. And there's lots of examples of this, but um, I think he, he created a very, very, very clever way of showing high quality images um, in Minecraft, which is, is just fantastic. And he really thought about the exhibition space as well. Um, and when you're creating exhibitions, in virtual um, immersive spaces, it's sometimes easy to get lost in what's possible. Um, and he kept this really grounded and really clean and really focused on displaying the work rather than the fantastical ideas that things can take, which is perfectly fine. And the considerations there, um, I thought were, were really great on his part, um, but the technical the technical workarounds that he found, I thought were particularly interesting. Um, and again, I'll try and share links either during conversations afterwards or at a late point if, if anyone is interested. Um, Steph Unger is an illustrator and I really fell in love with this when I found this, this exhibition. Um, and when we talk about kind of future curators and future skills, you know, the, the curators of tomorrow are the kind of gamers of today or those who are studying three-dimensional kind of um, studies and uh, 3D modeling and animation. Um, and Steph created this fantastic um, exhibition gallery space in um, Animal Crossing. 
And Animal Crossing does have this ability to kind of exhibit work, but she really created this um, process again in, in, in response to lockdown and uh, the pandemic. Um, but I think she kind of saw it as a residency. Um, and the one thing that was great about this is it also allowed uh, other uh, users, audience members, to be live in the space and capture the kind of comments about the work in the space. Um, and that's a really good function and feature, which again, I'll talk about more later with some other technologies. Um, but that was really important because some of this that she's captured, you wouldn't necessarily be able to capture in a real gallery space unless someone's walking around recording people. Um, so there's something about the medium of immersive spaces in kind of digital form that allow you to do that. Um, this is a platform called um, Occupy White Walls. I'm just trying to get my notes up. It's not following my notes. Um, and this is this is fantastic. When we talk about kind of MMOs, um, this was a ma massive multiplayer uh, online multiplayer platform um, that you can you can uh, access through Steam. Um, that is about just the creation of exhibitions um, is a really fantastic concept. It works really, really, really well. Um, I love that museum building for grown-ups. Um, but the, the one thing I find really fascinating about this is it has a, an AI called Daisy. Um, and depending on the work that you pick to put into your museum or your gallery, Daisy will kind of make suggestions of work that you may not know about. Um, and it's always being updated. So you can create really unique spaces um, quite quickly, quite easily, uh, powered by Daisy, um, uh, and you can you can create things that are quite traditional all the way through to things that are quite fantastical. And again, you have the ability to share the spaces with others and walk around them and see what others are making and working. And it's really treated like a game. I don't like the idea of gamifying um, exhibitions or museum experiences, but this is, is really a game about that um, rather than kind of uh, game mechanics being thrown into um, exhibitions just to kind of get audience interaction. Um, so do check that out as well. That's really, really good fun. Um, and then kind of when we talk about curating immersive um, spaces and environments, um, I think it's sometimes easy to forget that there are works that exist that you then have to curate. So trying to curate something that, that's non-tangible, um, I think can be quite, um, quite an interesting kind of uh, creative process. Um, so this um, this exhibition is the Rapid Response Collecting Exhibition at the VNA in London, um, and I struggle. I really struggled with this exhibition. I, I completely understand the VNA's kind of uh, ethos about um, sharing objects and design, um, but the thing I struggled with mostly with this is they showed the Oculus headset. That in, in fact the 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 early development kit, the VR headset. Um, and what I really struggled with was this is behind a glass cabinet. You can't touch it, you can't feel it, you can't put it on. And the really fantastic thing about the technology and the device itself is the immersiveness that it gives you once you're wearing it. So um, I absolutely get what the VNA are doing, but for me, it didn't allow me to fully experience the object. Um, and it didn't take me to the digital uh, world that it, it holds. Um, this is an exhibition by Megan Broadmeadow um, that was at FACT in Liverpool. Um, it's called Why Can't We Do This in Real Life? And it's based on this, this by the way, is one of, one, of the, one of what I think is the most brilliant examples of participant engaged um, creation of work. Um, but it was that was it was a piece of work that where that wasn't the focus. Um, it was really really fantastic to see the process behind this. Um, but Megan worked with some young people, some um, older people as well, part of the communities that are part of Fact in Liverpool, and she created a piece of work that was around the idea of Red Dead Redemption Two, which is a video game. Um, the things you can do in it, and there was a huge debate around um, a user, a, a gamer who streamed. Um, different things, different things that you could do in the game that wasn't quite clear. It was just exploring the mechanics of the game. Um, and he made this video of all the different ways you can kill a suffragette in the game. Um, and it wasn't that he was trying to make a political statement. Um, it was just exploring what you could do. 
Um, and it was very divisive. Um, and through exploring that video, exploring his methods with the different user groups, Megan created this really fantastic piece of her 360 VR work. Um, but it was really kind of the design of the um, how it was exhibited that I thought was really interesting as well. Um, especially around kind of the, the voting booths and the, the kind of iconography there with the different um, uh, kind of um, personalities involved in the game. Um, this is an exhibition that was at Quad um, in 2014 by Gibson and Martelli, who were our digital fellows at the time. And this is 80 degrees north. Um, in fact, the top left image is not part of that exhibition, just to be clear, that was another exhibition that we did slightly earlier called V20, uh, V01. Um, but the Gibson and Martelli exhibition um, of the, the other images in colour, um, it was a really fantastic display of adding layers of immersion into VR um, work. So you can see the pulley system uh, down in the bottom left, um, that was actually part of this balloon experience, um, the image on the bottom right. Um, and you, you, you were on a platform that wobbled when you were stood on it. You had this pulley system to kind of navigate through the experience. And you also had fans blowing cold air at you. Um, so it really kind of drew that immersion in. Um, and this work in the top right um, is a similar experience, but you saw it from a third person perspective where you had to wear 3D glasses um, to view kind of a wire mesh of the environment that you're floating around. Um, this is another piece. This was an in-house project um, at Quad as well called Glitch, the search for the lost MacGuffin. Um, it, we wanted to create something that was a game. We wanted to make a uh, not gamify an exhibition, but make an exhibition that was a game. Um, and through this exhibition, you used AR markers and AR to find clues of where this lost MacGuffin is, which is a kind of object that doesn't really do anything. It just takes you through the story. It's not really important. Um, and it was it was really well received because of the different stages it took you through like a film set. We really played on the film aspect of, of what we are at Quad. Um, but in terms of kind of participant engagement, one of the things that became really clear and it became really clear kind of after launch were some aspects of some audience members couldn't necessarily engage with it fully. And it's worth considering when you're, you're looking at immersive technologies is the different audience members that you're going to work with. So, for example, we have a group of parents uh, with under fives that we regularly work with at Quad, but they couldn't really engage with this exhibition because if you're trying to look after a child or have a child in your arm and you're having to hold an iPad and look for things and touch things on the screen, it just didn't work. So it really was an important piece of learning for us about what not to do with immersive exhibitions and, and how we can make things more accessible um, in future. Um, and this was our kind of last major VR exhibition um, with another digital fellow, Rebecca Allen, who's been working with VR and digital for, uh, and I think, 30 odd years now. Um, as well as uh, a new commission with Zane Zelmi, uh, Zelmi an East European artist. Um, and it was a really fantastic look at the, the ways you can um, display virtual reality work um, and how audiences can navigate through different spaces and be part of the work themselves whilst in the immersive spaces as well. Um, and another one by Megan Broadmeadow, again at Quad, this was Seek, Pray, Advance. Um, as Megan would say, it was an elaborate exhibition that was a uh, host to one VR work, which, <laughs> which it really was kind of part of a, a, a number of projects she was working with that came together within this exhibition. But you really had to take yourself through the exhibition itself just to get access to the work, um, to view that piece of work. But it was fantastic. It was a real, it was really theatrical uh, experience. And Megan is a performer herself. Um, as well as a visual artist. So it really kind of lent really well to her practice. Um, and as part of the VR exhibition as well, this was my first kind of real big deep dive into VR. And this was the Anime Teen VR Gallery, which was a commission um, by Anime Teen, who was supported by the BFI and Arts Council and Film Hub Wales. Um, and they approached us to say, what exciting things do you want to do? Um, and we were kind of like, we want to do something in virtual reality because we want to have participant led kind of work in virtual reality. 
And so um, this was a really great project. We worked with E21 Artspace to scan and build a VR version, a virtual version of our gallery space, which we still use. And it, it uh, exhibited some animation work, which we would normally have to put on loads of different projectors and manage sound and things like that. And we found really great ways of um, working around that for our virtual reality. But the two major things from this that I just want to point out is one, we had participant made work in the exhibition itself, which actually was commented on by our Arts Council inspection, which was, it was fantastic to see that in that report. Um, but also we, we really tried to look at how we give instructions to audience members who don't know how to use VR headsets um, when an invigilator might not be available. So um, I, I couldn't find the image of, of this panel here, but we really kind of tried to make the instructions as simple as possible. You put it on, you turn this, you press this, and that's it. Um, and it worked really well. And it was actually um, adopted by our senior curator for future exhibitions. So that was um, really great. Um, so tools and software, and I kind of put tools and software and current and future skills together because I think they're kind of intertwined. Um, you see on the left here SketchUp, a, a lot of curators um, and gallery technicians currently use SketchUp. And I think it's a really great place um, to start creating work and create and, and mocking up gallery exhibitions. But I'm, I'm a real big fan of Blender, which is on the right hand side. Um, I think you can do things, um, in my opinion, a lot simpler, but also with a lot better effect. So you can really see the texture of walls. If you want to have different colours and textures of walls, you can play with lighting. Uh, you can really adjust things a lot simpler, I think, um, even including um, kind of animation if, if that's needed, like if things move. Um, incidentally, I am doing a, a session on an introduction to Blender for um, curators uh, and those who want to create virtual spaces in a couple of weeks to form an international photography festival. So I'll share the link on the, the ACMC group um, when that's available. Um, but Blender, I think, is where future skills lies and especially kind of um, 3D packages like Blender and Maya. Um, they they offer a lot more than I think SketchUp does, although I think SketchUp is a really great place to start learning those skills. Um, there's also this debate around game engines and especially if you're working with virtual reality and augmented reality technologies, you'll come across the game engines and 99% of the time you would either be looking at using either Unity or Unreal Engine. Um, both are used to create AAA high quality video games. Um, both are used for uh, high quality architectural kind of displays and both are used for virtual reality. Unity is probably more accessible and easier to use, but Unreal Engine really gives that high quality, high um, visual output, even to the point where the, the new engine, Unreal 5, um, is really pushing what's possible with photo quality out, um, uh, imagery. Um, so those are, I think, skills and areas to look at that are really important. If you are interested, I would certainly start with Unity, although Unreal is getting a bit better at kind of being a bit accessible. Um, also think about scans and 3D scans and 3D models. Um, you know, photogrammetry and 3D scanning is becoming easier and easier. You can do it with your mobile phone device now. You don't need any extra kind of technologies. It used to be that you used to have to have a DSLR camera and a big rig and all these kind of things, but now we can just do them with mobile phones. And there's lots of places online that you can get access to 3D models if you do want to explore this. Um, the link in 3D scans there by uh, Oliver Larrick, um, I think they were done in like 2014 and there's some really fantastic, fantastic high quality, high, um, uh, highly complex 3D models. Um, that were done really early on in 3D scanning. Um, but, you know, museums and heritage organisations and galleries are still playing with this and still exploring it. And I think it's a really good skill to, to have, even if you're doing it on a really basic level. Learning how to scan an object and put it into a 3D space um, is, is not that complicated, but it can really make the difference on how you show something to an audience. Um, let's see. Things are a bit slowing down a little bit. Ah, oh, there we go. So um, this is just an example of how we scan 
um, objects. And this is actually from a project from a gr group of young people that we work with. So apologies if the, the, the kind of imagery there is a little bit gruesome, but she was a little bit obsessed with zombies. Um, and it was in response to an exhibition. So sometimes young people can take things in a direction you're not expecting. Um, but you can see that on the left hand side, this is using a structure sensor and uh, a piece of software called it sees 3D. Um, and the quality that you get from that scan that we can then put into a virtual space um, is really, really high. There's some kind of tweakage there that needs to happen, but um, it's still a really good example of, of visually how it looks. Um, and Tilt Brush, if you do have access to virtual reality headset, um, do give Tilt Brush a go. Um, if you did do look at my, or did see my talk a few weeks ago, or, or go go to look at it, I do use Tilt Brush a lot. I think Tilt Brush is really underrated. Um, there's some fantastic Tilt Brush artists out there. That is really now a thing. Um, but what Tilt Brush allows us to do is you can take uh, 3D scanned Matterport scans of exhibition spaces and import those as models that you can then stand in the exhibition space and draw over things and really um, change how an exhibition looks and respond to it and make notes and uh, all those kind of things. I think it's a really, really good tool to have and it's really accessible as well. It's really easy to use. Um, and just kind of finally, I'm really I really one thing that's really kind of making me uh, passionate at the moment is the kind of social aspect of immersive spaces and the social aspect of um, uh, gallery spaces. You know, I, I remember going to exhibitions with friends and family and talking about the work um, and things like uh, Hubs by Mozilla um, and the new platform New Art City, which is what we're running um, the former International um, Photography Festival on. Um, they allow um, audiences to be avatars. They allow to respond to kind of the work. Uh, Hubs is really, really about social. It's done by Mozilla. You can export selfies into Twitter and that kind of thing, and you can share emojis. Um, but New Art City is something that is uh, art artists created, again, in response to the pandemic, um, to show work. And it's a really fantastic space to really take concept of visual art and push the boundaries with it um, and although it's not as social what it does allow us to do is kind of look at co-curating and co-creating exhibition spaces with participants at the same time um, so those are kind of uh, two examples around kind of the social more participant um, engaged areas of uh, immersive spaces and I can see Andrea you've just popped up on my screen but I have that is my last slide so I have finished there so thank you very much <laughs>